Hello and welcome to On the Other Hand, a podcast that explores politics and other issues of importance to Arkansans through conversations with community leaders in Arkansas. I'm your host, Glenn White, and for today's conversation, April Chatham Carpenter, who usually co-hosts with me, she's sitting this one out, but she'll be back with our next guest. In this podcast, our goal is to serve as a venue for honest but civil conversations about a variety of topics with community leaders of diverse perspectives. Ultimately, what we want to do is to help reduce political polarization in Arkansas. On the other hand, is sponsored by Braver Angels in Arkansas, part of a national organization that aims to reduce political polarization, to help people discover common ground, and to promote a more respectful and productive exchange of perspectives among participants in our democracy. In our last episode with Jerry Henderson, we talked a lot about research and related theories regarding polarization and how the brain has evolved to easily allow us to join up with groups or tribes and to identify with them so much that many times our opinions and decisions are strongly influenced by these mostly unconscious motivations. In today's episode, we're going to further explore other strong influences on political polarization and its negative impacts. For example, have you noticed recently that you're having more damaged relationships in your life because of differences in political opinions? Well, so have we, and so has just about everybody else. So we cover that in our conversation. And then if you are worried about the negative impacts of media on polarization, you have good reason to do so, and we talk about that. We have many research and opinion leaders that agree the media influence is a big concern in many areas. So we cover that. We also cover uh, various ways that political polarization poses real threats to our democracy. We also talk about how it reduces healthy social supports and some of those impacts. So let's go ahead and get into this next phase of the conversation with Jerry Henderson on the science and theories of political polarization. You know, that uh, probably uh, leads us at this point to uh, maybe the next uh, discussion point, I think, uh, which is the negative impacts of polarization. So can you help us understand, uh, we've talked a little bit about some of that, but let's let's go into detail on some of the cost to this country uh, of having such extreme toxic polarization. Sure, and, and unfortunately, as most of us know, they're pretty significant. I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult. So once polarization reaches a toxic level, the negative impacts become more pronounced for both individuals, our public institutions, and particularly the health of our democracy, as we've discussed a bit before. I would imagine that many of us have experienced some degree of conflict and stress, either with family or friends related to tense and conflictual conversations across the political divide. You know, I'll break in for a moment and just kind of confess that i that's one of the things that got me started in this uh, field myself is I experienced that with family and friends, uh, particularly when I went back home to uh, another state uh, where I don't see people as often, but that's who I grew up with. And we had close, good, positive relationships Years pass, this uh, political polarization occurs, and of course, you know, if I had the same positions and ways of thinking that folks back home did, it might not be an issue, but I think differently and I have different um, ways of looking at things than in some ways the way I grew up, although I would argue that <laughs> that was a, the way I was raised was a strong influence on where I am now, but that, that's another story. The point was when I would go back home, um, and run into family or friends, there were times when I experienced some negativity that was a little bit surprising and shocking. It kind of uh, took me by surprise that we started talking about politics and things got heated. It got uncomfortable. It got unpleasant. 
I even had the experience uh, at one point of finally having a uh, an old friend from childhood um, unfriend me on Facebook. Uh, no kidding. Yeah, and That's... so you see that, and it, it, it it's unfortunate, but it really made me want to know. Being a psychologist, you know, I sure. said, okay, I, I need to understand more about that. So I went and looked up the literature, and then I got into the um, uh, chasing down numerous rabbit holes about you know, polarization and political beliefs and, uh, uh, you know, change in ideas and opinions. And, man, is it complicated. And, and if nothing else, I hope people understand from what we're going to be talking about, what we've said so far today uh, about the uh, research that the factors in, fo- in polarization are incredibly complex and wide-ranging. There are many, many different factors that all go together to, to impact things. Well, and what concerns me is I, I think there's a bit of a snowball effect. That is, it intensifies, it gathers in more factors that kind of feed the beast. So hmm. uh, I, I think you're aware of this, but a, a sad statistic from Pew Research is that about 70 percent, a little more or less, for Republicans and Democrats uh don't want their children marrying somebody from the other side. Yep. Yeah. Which That's, is just, gosh. Uh, yeah. It, it, it's actually, I, as an aside on that, that's, that's sad to know. But I will tell folks who are listening that if you have not checked out Pew Research uh, Center, do so. Google them. They are an excellent, excellent source of really solid research into uh, what people in this country are thinking about various topics. There's a lot about politics and other, you know, things important in our society. So that's a really good resource to keep in mind is a few research. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. Well, it's, it's also sad. And, and I'm, I would imagine most of us have heard about a family, family members that have actually ceased talking to one another due to their identification and strong loyalty to opposing parties. And you just kind of talked about a friend that, right. that that's started happening with. Um, I think we can become so identified with our political party that it starts to become a part of our identity, our, even our sense of ourself. It can lead to strong emotions and behavioral reactions regarding loyalty and our willingness to defend our party. And sadly, there's just a lot of, as we've been talking about to some extent, emotional pain that can be created by severe polarization. And there's always a cable news commentator who is willing to whip up uh, us into a frenzy of moral outrage. Um, So... For your own emotional health, beware of a steady diet of highly polarizing media. Yeah, yeah that, that's a, a good suggestion. And actually, I think we're going to get into that later because one of the things yeah. we're going to be talking about is the various influences, and certainly media is a huge one, but by no means is it the only one. And No. Yeah, and nor would it be true to say that all media is bad. There's some good media out there. There's still some good quality Journalist, I don't know if any of them rise to the level of Walter Cronkite. No. <laughs> but we have some good ones out there. But they're, they're kind of crowded out by the noisy ones, aren't they? Yeah. Well, it's true also. If uh, we didn't buy their polarizing product, they wouldn't be able to sell it. <laughs> true. Uh, yeah. But it, as I, we'll also talk about at some point, there are some very strong uh, reasons rooted in our evolution and our uh, neurological makeup that make it hard to resist that siren call. Yeah, yeah, there's there's something psychologically appealing to moral outrage. You know? <laughs> yeah, so what happens with this level of polarization in terms of the relationships with politicians? Well, as we've hinted at, they begin to have considerable disdain shown across the political aisle, and the functionality of Congress to address significant societal problems is greatly diminished, and we see that in, in Congress with the gridlock. And, yep. and, and they, like you said earlier, uh, they generate a lot of heat and very little light these days. And 
as I alluded to earlier, there, there appears to be a, some of the research suggests there's sort of a positive feedback loop that tends to form between the cues that citizens receive from politicians and then they have the tendency to start, as we also refer to, electing cultural warriors instead of mature and wise politicians. So in essence, this cycle of polarization does tend to feed on itself, and I would suggest we all need to be worried about that. Okay, Jerry, help me understand that a little better. So you, you talk about a positive feedback loop, that there's, there's some relationship between what the politicians are saying to their constituents and then what their constituents then tend to do with that. Can, can you explain that a little better? Well, one way to think about that is what happens in primaries. Like a fairly conservative, say, Republican politician, their biggest worry in many districts is being primaried further to the right. And we're the ones, they're the ones that take that strategy. Somebody runs to their right. Uh, so that's the cue, and they talk the language, and then we take the bait. That's, it's it's kind of like we're, we're positively feeding into the downward spiral of polarization. So, so. Uh, let's say in this case, and it, it probably is true, too, for some uh, districts where there, it's a fairly progressive uh, populist. That Absolutely. The same thing happens from the other direction. Sure. So when you have uh, candidates wanting to be elected to or reelected to Congress, uh, they first have to win their primary. Absolutely. And the primary is made up pretty much of voters that are in their camp, in their tribe. Sure. You know? And so if someone is kind of extreme from that direction, like an extreme uh, Democrat in a Democratic primary, and that gets some traction in that area and for the voters, then that other maybe otherwise moderate Democratic um, politician feels it's necessary to pander to the extreme elements and said so you've got this just overall barrage of extreme rhetoric yeah. and policy statements from both of them and, and it kind of and, and so you're saying then that also impacts the voters to say okay this must be the way things are yeah it's it's like as that polarization kind of infects the process of, uh, you know, we start demanding, uh, for instance, they're electing cultural warriors. I mean, some of those people, the, the, the rhetoric that they start out with and they're primarying someone, it's like, I'm further to the right than you. I'll, I'll fight harder than you. Uh, and sometimes they get elected. And it's like, we the voters need to think twice before we keep feeding the beast, you know. Okay, and the so. beast there being someone who's at extreme level. Well, polarization, Yeah, you know. It'll be interesting. I know one of the things I want us to talk about, uh, it probably won't be today, but uh, there's some interesting research on the nature of people who have extreme political beliefs, and it's interesting how similar they are on both sides. So I we'll, would guess, yeah. Yeah, uh, and we'll get to that later. Well, um uh, uh, go ahead and uh, tell me what else can you tell me uh, about some of uh, the negative impacts of polarization? Well, from a standpoint of the health of democracy, and we've talked about this earlier a bit, uh, because of the gridlock, there's kind of a loss of confidence in the democratic process to solve problems, you know. And then there's in, there also tends to be in this kind of severe polarization when it feels like an us and them thing, it increases the risk of political violence. Uh, when you tell me about that and you mention political violence, let's make it real clear what you're talking about. Are we talking about some metaphorical violence or actual physical violence? How do you mean that? Well, I, I think threats of death are violent. Okay, whether uh, they're carried out or not. Absolutely. Yeah. If you call up some politician and say, I'm going to, you know, take out your whole family, and, and that happens a lot, yeah. uh, I consider that violence. Okay, uh, got you. And there are some examples of actual physical violence. I mean, there was the sure. case of the, the gentleman who went to the uh, congressional soft uh, ball game a, a few years ago and— he was aiming at Republicans. 
Uh, right. And then you have things like uh, the person who is mailing, um, I'm forgetting now if it was explosive or poisonous stuff, but they're actually trying to mail things out to lots of Democratic leaders. So that, yeah. that also is part of what you're talking about. Sure. And, and so you're saying that high levels of toxic polarization kind of unleash more of that tendency in the population. Yeah, I mean, we have to appreciate we've got some unstable people walking around uh, yeah. out there, and, and they they may be ripe for taking the bait on that. Mm-hmm. So. Okay. It, it, most of the research supports that the, the biggest threat to democracy develops when the intensifying polarization becomes to a point that each side begins to see the other side as as almost an existential threat to their basic values and way of life. Um, and you can see if you develop that viewpoint, you, you'll you have a tendency to fight hard to win mm-hmm. and, and resist losing. So, so at that point, yeah, and I hear a lot of that now in the political discussion yeah, in the media, but it sounds like you're saying that people at an emotional level feel like, I'm going to die. I have to fight, you know, or I will lose my life or my family or my way of life. We'll, yeah. we'll be in the gulag before you know <laughs> or it. Or something, right? yes, yes. And okay. So it, at this point, the fear of losing, as, it, as we just talked about, becomes increasingly intense. And when we reach the point that our commitment to democratic principles is overridden by our desire to win. Political science say that's the critical time. And it's also the critical time when if whatever politician side it's on, if someone in power, an executive in power, starts to nudge outside the democratic norms, then it's incumbent on that, that party's members in Congress to stand up. Uh, and yeah, to basically to uphold reasonable values. To do the checks and balances that are built into the Constitution. And as, as many researchers say, if, if that test is failed in a culture, uh, then their democracy probably will start to erode. Uh, you know, that, that fits with something else I, I've heard, which is the notion that if you, uh, if you get to this level of polarization, people don't realize it, but our democracy is not necessarily etched in stone. It is more vulnerable than you think. It is much more on the honor system than you think. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, and and that may be hard for people to understand because we have laws, we have the Constitution, we have people that are assigned to enforce it. But I've seen that more and more when, when I look around me and hear what's going on and, uh, and read that, that the society really, despite the best system in the world, you know, can fall apart if people aren't willing to go along with it anymore. Yeah, I think the framers didn't have a tendency to think in terms of there would be a person in the executive position that would just bust through the norms. Um, well, I think they were uh, worried about that. That was, I mean, that's why they had the revolution in this country, right? Because they, they, King George was just, you know, a bridge too far for them, and they didn't want that to happen again. They did not want to be ruled by a single ruler who didn't have enough checks. Oh, and absolutely. On. They, they were. I mean, they were quite afraid of of the polarization, or, or, you know, that. Uh, but I, I think they thought that, that, that executives would follow the rules, more or less. And because that's not written into the Constitution. There are a number of norms that have set up through the last couple of hundred years that each president has, has you know, adhered to. Yeah. Um, so. yeah, yeah. So if they choose not to go along with it, it's surprising and shocking how few things can stand in their way unless most of the people, including people in their own party, are willing to stand up for the, the values of the democracy that our founding, you know, our founders had in mind. 
Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Well, in their book, How Democracies Die, a couple of Harvard political scientists uh, emphasized that the erosion process is actually very gradual and politicians use certain stealth. They don't want to overstep and, and then cause a huge reaction. So it's, it's kind of a slow, uh, insidious sort of process. It sounds like the, it's analogous to the, the, the frog in the pot of water as it starts to yeah, notice. Yeah, it. there's yeah. No, no big trigger that necessarily sounds an alarm that we hear. And it, if citizens fail to see the signals, that a political emergency is unfolding, then uh, look out. Um, to, to that point, it took Vladimir Putin almost 20 years to fully consolidate power into his position of autocratic control. Um, only a few years ago, he put the final nail in the coffin of Russia's democracy by having the parliament change the constitution that allowed him to sidestep term limits. Once term limits are violated, you know you're on a bad course. So, yeah. Yeah. He recently initiated to show the kinds of decay of freedoms that we have if polarization isn't stopped at some level. Uh, he recently initiated a 15-year prison term for anyone who criticizes the war in Ukraine. Or even called it a war, right? Yeah, right. So, I mean, uh, the hard lesson here is that if we fail to notice the erosion and dismantling of our constitutional norms, we are putting our personal freedom at risk. And what greater harm could there possibly be from polarization? Yeah. Certainly for our country. That, that sounds right. Um, Jerry, you know... Um, among the uh, other costs to um, to us and to the society and to the government, you know, I, I alluded to this earlier when I was talking about uh, my experience with uh, family and friends uh, back home and, and how that uh, was a problem. I think most people now have the, that similar experience of a rupture in relationships that's uh, related to the polarization, to the differing views politically and how extreme and emotional it's gotten. So I think that's a really important thing to talk about. Uh, one thing that occurs to me when I think about this, you know, in, in psychology, there are a couple of things that we know have a huge impact on outcomes in health. And we're talking about whether we're talking about physical health or mental health or whatever, there are a couple of things that are really key that cut across all other types of illnesses and factors and types of people. One is stress and the ability to manage stress. You know, that's really negative for health, oh, sure. whether physical or mental, you know that. The other is the level of positive social support so that if people have a good positive social support, like family, friends, church, you know, whoever, then their outcomes health-wise are much better by having that social support. Um, it's, it's more than just medicine, you know. Oh, sure. Uh, and yet um, people don't appreciate the importance of positive social support and how we do. And so one of the thoughts that comes to my mind is that as polarization increases and we have more and more problems in our relationships, that is decreasing significantly our access to the supportive social environments that we know make a difference in our overall health, physically and mentally. So it sounds like the, the toxic polarization in the country is actually decreasing the level of support for people across the country, and that makes it more likely that we have more and more physical and mental problems. Now, I don't know about the level of physical, medical illnesses and whether or not they've changed, but I can tell you that we have had a huge increase in mental health issues in recent years. Now, some of that is due to the pandemic, but it predates that as well. So that, I, to me, that's one of the mechanisms by which there may be some uh, problems with the increasing uh, uh, issues of mental 
health in our country is because the whole system is kind of toxic. It, it, it is, and, and uh, I think it, it illustrates the uncanny power of polarization that we would defend our party, you know, our tribe, um, over a, a bonded relationship with a family member. That's sad. When you, when you say that, you're like, really? We would do that? But it's happening a lot. Uh, right? It is. Yeah. Well, on that rather unpleasant note, uh, let me uh, suggest that we have a lot more to talk about. But we'll stop for now. Uh, looking ahead, I know that we want to talk in some considerable detail about the various causes. Some of them have been kind of hinted at already, but we want to go do a little deeper dive into what the research has to say about what produces or increases polarization, what are the factors that relate to our making decisions about our beliefs and our actions, uh, what influences that. So we'll get to that next time, but before you get to believing that this is just going to be just one big long downer of a podcast. <laughs> we are going to try to finish up with what the research also says can help. What are the things that can make things better? So that's uh, something we can uh, stay tuned for. Thanks to our listeners for joining us for this edition of On the Other Hand. We hope you enjoyed this part of our discussion on polarization with Jerry Henderson. Be sure to check out the rest of our conversation and future podcast episodes of On the Other Hand on the Braver Angels Arkansas website. That address is arkansas.braverangels.org, and you just go to the podcast page from there. We'd like to hear from your, our listeners. Uh, we'd like to know what feedback you have for us, what you like about our program, any suggestions you have for improvement, especially any ideas for speakers or topics that you'd like to see us cover. But basically, whatever you want to share with us, all you got to do is just email it to us. So if you go to the Braver Angels Arkansas website uh, on the podcast page, you will find a link to send us a Gmail, and that email address is otherhandar, no spaces, at gmail.com. That's otherhandar at gmail.com. On the other hand, is sponsored by Braver Angels in Arkansas. Music was composed by Randall Standridge of Jonesboro, Arkansas, and was performed by the University of Northern Colorado Symphonic Band, Dr. Richard Main, conductor. From your host, Glenn White, have a good evening, and let's keep the conversation going as we work to bring our community closer together.